So both Freud and Jung were passionate about art. And uh, Freud wrote to Jung in a letter, I must always have an objet d'art to love. And Jung is known to have said, when it comes to art, I can easily go non compass mentis. I join him. So where their passions differ is in the fact that Freud never delved into making, into using his hands with materials in order to shape form, which was central to Jung. This is an essential haptic relationship, uh, the relationship of perception uh, through the body and the sensations in the body. So this is what I want to call to your attention today. This is a, an important aspect of Jung's relationship to art, and I think it's directly relevant to clinical process. Uh, within the clinical encounter, one develops a special quality of attention, um, a diffuseness, and actually um, it's been interesting trying to put together this presentation because I see how um, working in the clinical space, you develop a diffuseness and then to bring back the other um, sort of way of focusing and bringing something through. It has been a real challenge for me to work on this paper. But I'm very happy to be here and to have this opportunity. Um, so I want to come back to that sense of time changing and how um, time changes, uh, the experience of time changes in the clinical space. And I want you to think of an artist at work with a material and how one can forget meal times and um, all sorts of um, particulars of bodily needs um, until the archetypal experience subsides. So we often talk about the product in art, but again, what I want to emphasize is uh, the time of the maker and the time of the creative encounter between uh, two people um, within a session. Can you help me? So you want to start from here? Yeah. So what I'm wanting to give space to on this day is, again, the importance of sensation, which um, sometimes when we lapse into talking about images um, as though they were disembodied, I think um, it's, it's an important um, experience um, to remember sort of the land of the body as being where the images um, emerge from, and especially when we talk about um, visionary artists. I think it's just a way in which we sort of dissociate from the actual um, place, the home of the image, um, which is the body. And actually, it was um, I was reminded, as um, previous presenters were talking about William Blake, that I think he's also the father of nudism. 
And I think it's an interesting arc how um, men or artists who are very visionary then find themselves um, grounding in nature, in the natural world, and the relationship to the body, again, as a sort of a, a compensatory arc. But I think it is um, very important not to um, divorce the two. So in this way, in his sort of exchange with the material, his both collaboration with it and the resistance to it, um, I think there's an Aristotelian aspect to Jung's work that um, we forget as um, we often ascribe him to more of a platonic sensibility. Our historian Tom Cummins says that traditional scholarship too often dissociates the image from the object and space of which it is a part. And the work of David Pritik and Bob Girard brings attention to this, positing that the haptic may be viewed as a secret sense and its importance should not be underestimated. As Paul Gauguin put it, I shut my eyes in order to see. When we speak of art, we need to remind ourselves that every image has a body and everything you touch touches you back. Just want to show you this image of um, the somatic sensory homunculus with a proportional representation of the surface of the skin in the sensory cortex and the representation of um, the areas of greatest sensitivity. This is from the work of Eric Kendall. Merleau-Ponty says, a human body is present when the seer and the visible between touching and touched, between one eye and the other, between hand and hand, a kind of crossover occurs when the spark of the sensing sensible is lit. Light, color, depth are not things not tangible concrete objects, yet they do exist. They are there before us, but only because they awaken an echo in our bodies and because the body welcomes them. I grew up in a country that contained the oldest monument still in situ in North and South America. This is the Lanzón, el gran imagen. It's a stone obelisk, an axis mundi that pierces a deep cave high in the Peruvian Andes. As a 12-year-old, I smudged charcoal over sheets of newsprint to make illicit stone rubbings, while my father drew the caretaker's attention elsewhere. So I have a haptic feeling for this image. What Merleau-Ponty might call a carnal formula, an internal visceral equivalent to the representation, what Jung would call the feeling tone of the phenomenon, and Shakespeare in King Lear to see feelingly. So I think um, Jung talks about um, the emotion in an image, and it's been interesting to bring up this image of uh, the Lanzón and um, to see how over the few weeks that I've been working on this, um, the visceral um, emotions that it's awakened in me. And it's been very interesting to, um, to, to live with the image again 
and to see how it, it holds so much of um, my land, my experience grow, growing up. And I mention that more from the point of view of um, what it's like to be someone who comes from two different geographies and the experience of trying to reconcile both the, the, the inner images of, um, of, two, of different cultures. And maybe that's also why I'm so interested in the work in the body from the point of view of trying to, to, um, to find my, my own geography. But I wanted to share these images from you. They're from um, Chavin de Huantar. They're all stone, and they're all um, 1200 BC. And um, it was part of my father's work to, um, to photograph them and to make sure that um, they were not lost. Let's recall Jung's story of how he played with stones on the shores of Lake Zurich after his break with Freud and found it to be such an intense source of libido, actually the only source of libido. This captured my imagination, having played with stones at an Andean pilgrimage, um, Koyuriti, where you play with stones in order to concentrate on what you wish to manifest through play and you build little um, uh, buildings and um, sort of strategize with stones. In fact, this is one of the reasons that I became a Jungian analyst is because of Jung's um, story about stone. That's sort of what captured me initially in memories, dreams, and reflections. Jung recalls as a child coloring a miniature black and white stone that he placed with a carved wooden figure in his pencil case and the satisfaction that he experienced by making and hiding this figure. He also describes an existential encounter as a youngster when he sits on a stone and finds himself wondering, am I the one who is sitting on the stone? Or am I the stone on which he is sitting? These recollections emerge through the haptic sensory experience of playing with stones. And it is in this playful process that what unfolds is the flood of images that result in the drawings and paintings that are reconstituted in the Red Book. Not surprisingly, he stops work on the Red Book to turn again to stone, this time to create a life-size container, a tower. Its shape, I think, is foretold by his pencil case. In it, he can live the self, just like the little wooden mannequin within the pencil case with all the little pieces of paper that he would put in there and little sayings that he possessed there. I think I sort of imagined the pencil case standing up and turning into a tower. In the tower, he can live the self that has emerged through the haptic encounter which he calls living life in the round. So I've chosen to speak about this stone because it is what Gaston Bachelard calls actively lyrical for me. It's accompanied me for the last seven years and though I still feel that speaking about it I lose some of the numinosity that it has for me. It also is, an, I think, an important engagement after seven years to um, receive a new impression through the engagement with you about it. The stone exemplifies for me the importance of play and the centrality of the haptic, the shadow and the world of alchemy that was Jung's container and his mirror the Lapis Philosophorum, known as the elixir of life that could restore youth. It's made of gray sandstone, about a foot and a half in height, width and depth, 
And as you see here in the image, it's been placed at the entrance to the tower, the home of his personality number two. Jung carved it over a period of two years to mark his 75th birthday. It's reminiscent in form to monumental epigraphs and stelae of the ancient world. As we see, Jung often chooses ancient canons to give form to his expressions. It is a monument to the shadow, to the alchemical dictum that the wrong stone is what creates the work. Or as he said in volume 12, the right way to wholeness is made up of fateful detours and wrong turnings. As the art historian Anton Ehrenzweig says in his Hidden Order of Art, this is a happy accident. And any truly creative work involves casting aside sharply crystallized modes of rational thought and image making. To this extent, creativity involves self-destruction. The rejected nature of the stone speaks to what every artist knows and is central to Jung's psychological vision, that there is a prospective call in any mistake. Is it high enough? Can we make it louder? caught my fantasy. So the stone is square and has maintained its basic shape. I think that it's interesting that its shape has not been changed. It's not as though, um, as Michelangelo says, as sort of the, the uber sculptor, that there's a spirit within the stone that Jung is trying to make emerge, but rather it's that the square shape embodies the alchemical dictum of the circle being squared, if we think of Jung's description of his life as being in the round. Jung carved three of the four sides of the stone. The fourth side was left untouched. At one point, he says it was not necessary to carve it as it faced the bushes. At another juncture, he says he would carve the cry of Merlin on it. Another thought is that it would reflect the Taoist idea of the untouched stone or the alchemical prima materia. And I just wanted to share with you here a little secret. You see the facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in the building of the museum, to represent the prima materia, the builders placed a series of rough, unhewn stones in the capitals um, to preserve the Masonic tradition that symbolizes man in his infant or primitive state. 
So there are hidden traces of alchemical dictums um, throughout New York City as well. So the central section of the stone is carved with a combination of both image and quote. And here you see it. The central image is that of the pupil of an eye or a mandala. In it stands a pupilla or a small doll that is the reflection of ourselves. This figure is also identified by Jung as Telesphorus, whose name means completion, and who would have been recognized by the ancient Greeks as the child of Asclepius and the brother of Hygieia. He is marked by the symbol of Mercury, the transgressor of boundaries who moves easily between liminal spaces. The figure is pointing the way with one hand and holding a lantern in the other. He's also an aspect of the Kabiroi of Samothrace, who we find throughout the Red Book. In the Red Book, the Kabiroi voiced the following, we hauled things up, we placed stone upon stone, now you stand on solid ground. C.A. Meyer, relates them also to the dactyls. In his study in Asclepius, he tells of their origins. Rhea's fingers were caught in the maternal earth of Mount Ida as she's straining to give birth. Her fingers became the dactyls, who possessed generative power. Therefore, they were accounted gods of healing, embodying the creative power in the touch, in the hand. In Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, Jung speaks about this figure as the creative impulse. And I think what this figure has um, come to mean for me is um, what I call the leap into the pupilla. And I, I, I feel that leap you know, how he, he, he talked in the, the film about he leapt when he saw the, when he caught the idea of the stone being the wrong stone. He said, ah. And then he speaks of um, how the block grabs his fantasy. And what's grabbed my fantasy with this image is the idea, again, of the leap to the life within and the leap into the sensation of the body and the leap into the embodied aspect of active imagination, which I feel is, is a link that we, we forget when we speak, um, again, about, about the visionary. This is another image um, painted by Jung, not from the Red Book, but I see it again as the, the eye and then radiating out from the experience of that inner sight are the, um, the images that come alive in the Red Book. And I think that leap um, is the moment of his first act of imagination. And I think um, one of the things that struck me was the physicality of his first encounter with active imagination, that he heard sounds, that he had strange sensations in his body, and that it was a very powerful physical experience as well as an experience of images, and I, I think every, every image has its valence, and as you see, I'm kind of struggling with how to, how to talk about it, but I think the nation in active imagination is the land of the body for me, and I, that's what I'm trying to work with and um, what I think is most important for me right now. On a separate note, 
I want to mention in relationship to the hands that Jung encouraged Julius Speer in his pursuit of psychochorology by studying the hands of children. And his practice continues to this day in Israel. It's kept alive by Rali Neumann, who was taught by her mother, the wife of Eric Neumann, who was Speer's student. And it's a process where um, they take black ink and rub it across each palm, and you make an imprint. And then uh, Spear had created um, a series of questions and an archetypal formula the way he saw it, and then he would read the hand accordingly. The footage that I showed you was taken in 1950 by the filmmaker Jerome Hill and edited by the late Jonas Mikas, who is uh, the founder of Anthology Film Archives, which is right near here and such an important presence in um, the world of documentary film, uh, both universally and in New York. Jonas Mikas edited into a short entitled Lapis Philosophorum, which you can find by that name on YouTube. Jerome Hill was a contributor to independent film in New York City and went to visit Jung accompanied by his cousin Maud Oakes and they recorded this monument. While in the hospital suffering from injuries that she had on an accident in the Peruvian Andes on her way to visit the Lanzón, which I showed you, Maud Oakes was shown a photograph of the face of Jung Stone by a friend. In her book, which you see here, she speaks of the personal transformation that occurred in relationship to this stone. The design of the surface of Jung's sculpture had the effect of turning on the light in a dark, stale room. It was indeed the opener of a door for me, me who lacked all energy and interest. She said the effect on her was like that of a Navajo sand painting ritual in which the person who is sick is placed at the center of the image. Her transference to the stone was the beginning of her healing. She would go on to become an important scholar in the realm of Navajo ritual. When she visited Jung, she told him of her enthusiasm for the stone. And she was devastated to hear him say, that stone is nothing. I am not an artist. I did it to amuse myself, it's a holiday thing, as if I sang a song. She insisted to herself that this was not true. But as she was leaving, he looked her straight in the eyes and said, I need not have written any books. It is all on the stone. Maud spent several years studying the stone, resulting in this book. And at one point, Jung said to her that her interpreta interpretation might sound a little too much like Jung dogma. He wrote, you understand the stone as a statement about a more or less limitless world of thought images. I quite agree with your view. One can read symbols like that. When I hewed the stone, I did not think, however, I just brought into shape what I saw on its shape. I have no religious or otherwise convictions about my symbols. They can change tomorrow. They are mere illusions. They hint at something. They stammer and often lose their way. They try only to point in a certain direction, as does the little Kabiroi figure. But he's saying it's about the psyche in movement. They are nothing but humble attempts to formulate, to define, to shape the inexpressible. To my surprise, I read that Jung suggested to Maud Oakes, after her interest in the stone, that the place she should go visit are the caves of Lascaux and Pechmerel. I will never forget my first art history class and the image of the hands on prehistoric caves, which was a numinous experience for me. These marks marked me. They were an encounter with a numinosum. A quality radiates from them that is not lost even in copies. 
I had never visited them, never seen them. I don't know what the, it's like to see the real thing. But there's quality that radiates is what I understand Jung talking about as the impulse in the blood. This is a quality of concentration, of need. The need to express something. You feel that the person must make this image. And you can see that in the work of outsider artists like Bill Trailer or in the art of the mentally ill. There's a quality of self that comes through and is not mediated by ego or excellence. D.T. Suzuki has said that the illness of modern man is losing the loving relationship to his hands. His view was that a man learns to think with his hands. And I think that's something that Jung deeply understood. And certainly, um, it's what the arts and craftsmen's movement that was um, contemporaneous to him intuited and that he's part of that uh, romantic move against industrialization. Art is about the transmission of inner states. Making art is a living process of concentration. In the painting of Christian Orthodox icons, for example, the application of the materials and the hierarchy of color and form is considered a measured meditation, which comes to an end in the opening of the eyes of the icon with the final strokes of the iris. And here, I think this speaks to Jung's passion for archaic form from the point of view, again, of the time of maker and the layers of the encounter with the material. All art, one could say, is a mandala, a concentration, an action of bringing to a center, which is work in the analytic space as well. As Anton Ehrensreich notes, the creative thinking is capable of alternating between differentiated and undifferentiated modes of thinking, harnessing them together to give him service for solving definite tasks. More recently, neuroscientist Ian McGilchrist has brought our attention to this in his research on the activity of the right and left hemispheres of the brain. He says the brain has to attend to the world in two completely different ways. And in so doing, he brings two different worlds into being. In the right brain, we experience the live, complex, embodied world of the individual, always unique beings, forever in flux, a net of interdependencies, forming and reforming wholes, a world with which we are deeply connected. In the left, we experience a represented version of it, containing now static, separable, bounded, but essentially fragmented entities, grouped into classes on which predictions can be based. It is a general understanding that central to modern art is the elevation of self-reflectivity and self-criticism to subject matter. This is how Jung is modern. This is how Jung's work is radical. His disruption is in content, not in form. His abstract process was in coming to the images. He's making a relationship to the self without doctrine, and therefore he holds to the ancient canons. As Anton Ehrenzweig writes, it is only in really new art that we can fully appreciate the attack on conscious sensibilities and the anxiety which all artistic innovation entails. He speaks about bringing the non-rational into accord with the rational realm and how that produces a new order. So I think Jung was working with the production of a new order and having that the opposites of both ancient canons and ways of working versus a new way of being. There's one more quote that I want to bring in from Jung, and um, I was also delighted to hear a whiff of Spanish. In um, his letter to Maud Oaks, he says, 
when he writes her about the stone. The stone is not only a product of thought images, but also the product of feeling and local atmosphere, i.e. the specific ambiente of the place, the all-important feeling tone of the phenomenon, the ambiente. The stone belongs to the secluded place between the lake and hill. It expresses the beata solitude and the genius loki, the spell of the Walden spot. It could be nowhere else and cannot be thought of or properly understood without the secret web of threads that relate to its surroundings. And so I think that's what I'm trying to work with from the point of view of connecting active imagination to the body. Only there in its solitude as orphanus sum, and only there does it make sense. It is there for its own sake. Under such conditions only, the stone will whisper its misty lore of ancient roots and ancestral lives. The night that Maud got that letter, she understood the resolution of her transference to the stone and ended her book. Stone is from the center of the earth, symbolic of cohesion, formed in conditions of death over eons, the perfect foil for the fragmenting quality of the emergent image within. As Jung wrote in a letter dated April 9th, 1959, the journey from cloud cuckoo land back to reality lasted a long time. In my case, Pilgrim's progress consisted in my having to climb down a thousand ladders until I could reach out my hand to the little clod of earth that I am. This stone, like the determinative sign that is placed at the end of an Egyptian word to sum it up, is his lapis philosophorum the embodiment of his understanding. As Jung wrote in a letter to Maud Oakes, try and dwell in this wholeness for a while. See what happens to you. So I have not given you all of the sort of rational inscriptions of the stone, but I invite you to see what the numinosity of these stone brings for you because I think it is a treasure trove. Thank you so much for your kind attention.